Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode, episode five of the Grit, Getting Gritty podcast. And today we have Yarif Wolak, as usual, and we also yep. have a legendary writer from FlyersNittyGritty.com, Dan Mullane. Dan, welcome to the show, youngster. <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. Nice. So give us a little information about yourself for those who don't know you. All and right. to get a little more following on your Twitter because you're throwing out some good content. And I think that people should, uh, you know, be able to find you somehow. Thanks. Uh, well, first of all, my Twitter handle is dmilla18, uh, just in case anybody wants to look that up. Uh, information on myself is um, typical Northeast Philadelphia guy. Uh, I'm a 4 for 4 in all the sports, but obviously hockey is my my number one passion. Um I got really into hockey probably when I was in about sixth or seventh grade, and ever since then I've just been like addicted to it. Addicted, yeah. So that means you're taking your shirt off and stuff like that, using it as a rally towel. I've been known to do stuff like that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes, because that's the first <laughs> thing I'm going to do when the uh, you know season reconvenes. Yeah, I'm probably going to. Um, I don't even know what I'm going to do. Drown myself in alcohol that night. <laughs> So you and I have a lot to talk about, and Dan does as well. For uh, Give every single one of us a follow, because I'm telling you, we're putting out some really good content. But let's dive right into it. Let's talk about this, you know, the coronavirus, unfortunately. We still have to talk about it, but we're going to talk about stuff in a positive light. So with that being said, there was a Board of Governors meeting, and before this phone call started, Dan was filling Yarif and I in. Uh, he had a little more information than the both of us. I only got limited information, and that was from Pierre LeBron. So, Dan, why don't you give us some ta- you know, talk about the Board of Governors meeting that took place at 3 p.m.? Uh, the Board of Governors meeting, they pretty much just said, you know, there's a hold and send the players back to, you know, wherever they want to go to pretty much their hometowns, their houses across the states and in Canada, and pretty much a self-quarantine until the end of – March, which everybody's doing right now. So, um, I think just the players, just like everybody else, the fans, the GMs, they're just kind of just waiting to see how this all unfolds. And what what is your personal belief? Are, are you more optimistic, or are you do doom and gloom? Just so viewers know exactly like where you stand. Uh, do you believe the season's going to reconvene at some point? Uh, can you dive a little more into the dates that are that are mentioned, if you don't mind? Yeah, well, <clears throat> me myself, I do think that eventually there will be a season. That the timeline is just so up in the air right now because after this two weeks, you know, or not two weeks, you know, the end of March quarantine, um, how effective everybody's social distancing and and the uh, the medication and the treatment of people that have had it, see how how well it progresses. But um, me myself, I think that maybe players might start coming back to their playing cities in the middle or end, end of April, I'm hoping and thinking. Um, but as of right now, I believe that... Oh, I have to do... I have to look up real quick. No, you're okay. You're okay. It, yeah. You have a lot more information than your reef and I. And if your reef wants to chime in, he could chime in too. Yeah, well, I... <laughs> I was just going to say, I mean, listen, it's a tough position to be in in general for the league. Um, They don't really, you know, you don't want to be too optimistic and, you know, get everybody's hopes up that the season's coming back and then not be able to deliver at the end of the day, right? Really rather just say plan for all situations. And I would imagine right now they're planning for next year and to play this year out at the same time, right? They have all these things and they need to start coming up with unique, you know, unique ideas probably that we've never heard before i brought something up on the last episode obviously about keeping people together keeping you know you can have a singular tv crew you can have a singular city a singular stadium uh you can do a lot of this stuff you know for the playoffs you know i don't know if you can do it for regular season if they're going to play that out i assume that would be out at this point but you know they could try to do something unique but i mean i think what where i stand personally i I still just I, i see the season kind of you know, I don't see them compromising next season. I don't see them compromising two seasons. You know, if they if this stretches too far, I, I have to imagine that they'll pull the plug on the season at some point. I, I'm That's where I stand on it. And, and, and it's crazy because day after day, I'm like, the season's going to reconvene. The season's going to reconvene. And now 
after all these cases are coming out, what is it, up to 350,000 worldwide now, uh, uh, confirmed cases, and just 117 deaths in this in this in New York alone, and you know Washington State is follows right behind them with 95. I'm like that. Those were the numbers I was given today earlier. Now this is earlier, you know, this morning, so the numbers could have risen by then. But each time, I'm like, oh, it's getting worse, which is was supposed to. It's supposed to peak, right? And then it's supposed to flatline and then peak again. So with that being said, it's like, you know, because once it flatlines, people are going to think, okay, everything's back to normal, and then it's business as usual, and then stuff spikes up again. And that that is my fear. And, and that is why I'm like, now, today, I'm not as optimistic as I was a week ago when we did last week's podcast. It, because the more that this stuff comes out to, you know, to us, the information that we're given, and they just keep going. It, first, it started with, Groups of what 50, 50 or more, or 50 or 50 or less was suggested, and now we're down all the way like a, a week and a half, two weeks later, and it's 10 or less, you know. And now the essential businesses it's only essential employees only, you know, on the roads now, in Maryland and uh in Delaware for that matter. I can't, I won't speak on PA, but uh, because I'm not as familiar with uh PA, I, all I know is that Montgomery County is being hit hard, but uh, so I'm not as optimistic. And, Dan, what was the original timeline uh, that the NHL gave? Well, the original timeline that the NHL gave really wasn't um, a definite thing. It was just telling the players to quarantine themselves until the end of March, until they get further direction. But since then, the NHLPA put together a, a little proposal to the NHL to try to say, why don't we shoot for this to um, you know outline the rest of the year. And I actually have it in front of me, and it says, the players' proposal for restarting the season is training camp early July, 2019-2020 or season finishes late July, playoffs start August through September, draft and free agency in October, and begin the next season, 2020 and 2021, in November. That is great. And do you – see, that timeline, it's August through September, and we know that the playoffs usually start mid-April – and they end around the first or second week in June, depending on how it falls, depending on when they're, where, where the season ends. So that's an entire two months. So we're looking at October, September, October. Do you think that that's a realistic timeline? And uh, and uh, to what, play 70 games in, uh, what, 2020-21? Well, no, I think the players actually think they're going to play a full 82 next season, but just shorten breaks. Like, you know, they have that week where every team has off. Maybe they would shorten yeah. that. Um and for really, in the NHL's point of view, if the players want to do that, I'm sure the NHL, because they won't be losing revenue if they don't shorten the season. I don't, I don't think they really care how the players want to handle it as long as the season right, right. is played and they make their money back. Because you got to look at it as a business from the NHL oh. owner's point of view. Yeah, and you came up with an inter- interesting topic earlier, like not with our discussion that we had before the show began. And you said that uh, the NHL can really reconvene these are just suggestions from the CDC. So the NHL essentially uh, is their own entity and and they could re- reconvene really at any time, correct? I believe so. But like Yuri was saying also is, you know, essential businesses is essential businesses in some states. It's not like that everywhere. So if New York says essential businesses only, I don't know if the NHL really has the power to say, Hey, we're right. bringing our guys back to, to train and to treat their injuries and stuff like that. I don't know if that's really there. This is all great insight, and this is a lot more insight than me personally. I only speak of myself, but I'm not going to speak for, you know, your reef and Lance and whatnot, who's come on the show previously. But this is great insight from a little more insight than what I've been given, you know, the viewers. So th- th- thanks a lot for this, uh, for clearing this up, because, you know, our, our viewers, you know, they mean a lot to us. And I think they deserve the best coverage that there is, you know, available and you know, if we could give them the most information, regardless of who gives it, I think it's, you know, great. What, what do you think, Yurif? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, again, I think we're all kind of sticking, staying tight to this story. And I think we all really want to know more. But I, I think, unfortunately, we're just going to have to wait because we don't even know about the health of the players, right? Like, we, we're saying all this, and what if there are some cases on the team right now, and all of a sudden that goes out the window? Really, what what I think 
my realistic anticipation is if I was a business owner, I would want to play as many games as possible. Um, and that's why I would look to try to get next season, you know, perfect or as perfect as right. I can. Yeah. And that's where I would start putting all my energy is how do I make sure that next season we can start next season when there is, from what I'm told, an inevitable spike again, right? Because this isn't a, a virus that will ever go away. People have to realize right. that like the flu is never gone away. We will get a vaccine. We will, we will all, in my opinion, be all under con control, but quite frankly, this will be an issue next year as well, right? So they have to start planning on how to exactly. minimize the impact, right? Because they're going to have to do some kind of hybrid model. You know, theoretically, we'll have a vaccine by then. I, I'm pretty confident, but who am I, you know, that we'll have a vaccine? Um, and I think that one, once that happens, everything will kind of normalize and stabilize over time. We'll have people at least getting back into watching the games. You know, they got dev camp. They have all of these things that happen over the summer, it's, you know, why even compromise? I understand that it would suck not to give away the, you know, the Stanley Cup winner there. Um, yeah. But, you know, unfortunately, you know, they, they risk next season too. So at this point, I would say just cut your losses. But I would still be open to it. You know, it's not that I would say close the door on it. I would say keep the door open um, and hope that things are optimistic. Give it the two weeks. Give it the three weeks if it's possible. But I would, in my mind, give it give this essentially a cutoff that if, if I couldn't start the playoffs with the standings the way they are today, or at least the top six teams, right. um, you know, in both conference, then I'm pretty much assuming the season is over, right? Because wild card, you can make a case that there are a right. bunch of teams fighting for a wild card spot, but the other yeah. spots, you know, they were defined, and it's like that you could go with. But I don't know. I don't know if we're on that path. I don't know if if that's a realistic situation. You know, leading with the fact that it's a health concern, also and yeah. There's so much to do with it, but we'll see. You know, time will tell. One thing, one thing that struck, one thing that was neat today uh, that we haven't mentioned is that the, the board of governors did have some members from the CDC present for this conference call, and I thought that that was kind of cool because that, it really means that the NHL is taking this serious, you know, and they want the best for the health and safety of not sure. only the the staff and players, but you know, the spectators as well, because this is one of the reasons why it's the greatest sport on earth. And, you know, because of the proud spectators that pack that house, that buy the merchandise, you know, just are, are with, you know, this sport, you know, have given blood, sweat and tears. And I think that they deserve kudos. And I think the NHL does, too, for for bringing the CDC on board because they could have just went with this and just done their own thing. But they're yeah. actually taking the advice of the CDC. And I and I thought that that was kind of neat. And that was tweeted out by uh, Pierre Lebron is where I got that uh, information from. So that was kind of cool. Now. Let's let's end this doom and gloom, right? We need yep. to get some stuff that's positive. And before we get in, you know, I just want to say one last thing. Damn the coronavirus, right? The Flyers will be cup contenders right now as we speak. And damn it, that stupid coronavirus. Uh, I don't mean to be insensitive to anybody that has, you know, come down, you know, with the virus. I pray for them. Uh, I pray over we pray over grace and stuff for everybody involved. And for those who have uh, su suffered the unimaginable tragic death due to this uh, horrible virus. But, of course, when the Flyers are good and you got that 2010 feeling again, you know, uh, this magical season, what happens? The damn coronavirus stands in its way. And Jamie, I, Jamie, I got a little bit of silver lining that I thought of today. Um, <laughs> if you think about the trade deadline the flyers didn't go out and trade any of their first round picks they didn't go out and sell the farm um yep. you know for a lot of people who wanted it obviously you didn't see this coming so this isn't a like haha i told you so but it's kind of a silver lining that at least we didn't make any any decisions there at the end that would compromise Rats. next season right yeah. yep. and 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 i thought about this we have a lot of competition within our division that did um, that's going to hurt them for next season where we're adding guys like, and I'm, we're going to talk about a little bit like Tanner Lashinsky into the oh, conversation man. for next year. You know, yeah. we also didn't give up any assets, um, at the end of this year. So, you know, we have that to look forward to as well in the off season, the draft will happen regardless of people can get together or not. There is no enough doubt. scouting material on all of these players for NHL teams to select players. So, you know, I would expect that regardless, you know, regardless yeah. of the situation with the, uh, the virus. Dan, what do you make? Uh, were the Flyers Cup contenders, in your opinion? Uh, did you feel like it was, like, in 2010, like you were watching? Because I know you were live tweeting yesterday of uh, Game 7 against Boston. Did you think that this Flyers team was as talented 
is that 2010 team, if not even more talented than that 2010 team? Well, <laughs> that's a tough question, but I think they're they're similar in the fact that they're both deep, but I think they're deep in different ways. I think that the Flyers now have obviously better goaltending than they did back then. Yeah. Um, I think that yeah. th- our defense is actually like sneaky solid right now where – there's not one guy that you can point to that says, like, oh, my God, like, we don't want him out there for more than 20 seconds at a time. Whereas if you look at the 2010 team, Krychek and the Ryan Parent, third parent, yep. they played, they played like, a Great shift point. every – every. It's, it felt like every 15 minutes they get one shift for 40 seconds and, and jump right yeah. off. I don't even think um, they played Parent at the end there. Dude, it was, yeah, I don't, I thought it was crazy. Were. I'd see, like, yeah. 77 out there. I'm like, who the hell – oh, my God, I forgot he was right, even right. playing. And then, That's uh, so true. I honestly forgot. I didn't even notice him last night. <laughs> and then um, the Wonder- Flyers up front back then, though, I think we're a little bit deeper than we are now. Just proven, like proven players wise, because yes. you had Giroux. Like the Flyers don't have that one really young player like he was at the time that was yeah. almost dominant back then, like in, in the playoffs oh. at least, not in the regular season. Yeah, but um, yet. they were yet. they were, they were very. I mean, the Flyers this year. It sucks that this happened because they were. You know, they you were know on what? a roll. You know what, Dan? I, w- I want to contradict that statement a little bit because I I do agree with the overall sentiment of the talent uh, thing and the developed nature. I mean, we had Richards, Carter. I do agree with that. But while we didn't have Giroux, and don't get me wrong, Giroux is, in my opinion, the, you know, the best player we've had in the modern era since, you know, Eric Lindros. But uh, for, for the most part, uh, Travis Konechny, I mean, he's had a pretty monster season. We don't know what kind of playoffs he would have had. I mean— Maybe he would have had a big playoffs for all we know, right? He's a big, he's a big gamer. He's not a center, you know. But Giroux, you know, similar age, similar point of impact onto the team, where Giroux was already playing a big role. Um, I do understand your sentiment, but we do have some, right? If Patrick was healthy, you know, theoretically, maybe that would have been our guy this year. I'll, I'll just say that where Giroux was playing in the lineup compared to where Konechny plays in our lineup today is is much different, and that's what leads to the, the depth that they had up front. They had Giroux on the third line with JVR and Ashram, and that line was probably our best line in that Boston series. It is amazing. Yeah, that's a good point. The it depth was, it was awesome. It, it made me realize how much I underappreciated Mike Richards. Like, uh, like the guy was phenomenal in his prime, and that yes. was prime Richards there. And it, it, I, I think that I, on myself, I only speak on, I underappreciated his services and rewatching, you know, some of the games. I loved him at times, you know, especially against Montreal with when he got the, uh, you know, coined the shift, you know. Yep. Uh, yeah, of course. Had, uh, you know, I appreciated him then, but there were some things that he would do that I underappreciated, and now I appreciate him even more. I'm like, oh, my God, the dude is freaking yeah. awesome. He was and, awesome. And this is, and this is great, great rewatching. Because I'm able to correct my mistakes, and one mistake was I should have appreciated uh, Mike Richards, you know, a little more than what I did, when, you know, during his tenure. So, and I think I've become wiser over the years, you know, to appreciate people's, you know, talents and stuff, you know, more. But that was one that I definitely have to own, and you know, make, try to make right. You know, what's Move. so funny too. Um, you know. If if you look at his line mates, like not in the very beginning of the the Devil series, but more towards like the Boston and Montreal series, he was playing with Dan Carcillo, who is he was what he was. I mean, he had to play up in the lineup because of injuries, but um, he was playing Dan Carcillo and Simone Gagne on a broken foot, pretty much. And then mm-hmm. when Jeff Carter came back, he was playing with Gagne on one wing with a broken foot, and Jeff Carter with a recently probably not one hundred percent broken foot as well. So yep, yep, That's like, good memory. And you know. They just had those clutch performers, Simone Gagne, Danny Briere, just potting, you know, Mr. Playoffs, just potting goal, big goal after goal, and timely goals. And Billy you know, Leno had a monster Billy year that year, too. God, yeah. That's how he got his big contract, you know, with Buffalo. Yeah. You know, and he was vintage with us. You know, when, when, when the Flyers didn't resign him, I was a little upset. I'm, I'm not even going to lie. But then I was like, yeah, and but then after at the end of the day, I was like, "Huh, I definitely don't price. think uh, he was not f- exactly." And that's when I was like, "Nah, I understand." You know, he was going after the almighty dollar, and then Buffalo fans are crying the blues. What ha- midway season in, man, he sucks. And uh, you know, <laughs> whatever. But you know, it yeah. is. But he gave us he gave us some memorable mo- moments too, especially that OT winner. 
But, I mean, uh, at the at the time, it was a waiver pickup. It was a brilliant pickup. I think that was Holmgren's one of yeah. That was Holmgren picked him up for nothing my, for the Red Wings. Yeah, it was phenomenal. Was, and most people don't know this, but Billy Leno didn't start playing hockey till he was like 18 years old. Something like yeah. that, something stupid like that. Uh, yeah, he was like a freak uh, sports talent. Somehow ended up, you know, one of the best players in a Stanley Cup, you know, game like years later, you know, with millions of dollars in his pocket, just picking up hockey one day. And then rewatching Game Seven, I was falling down in my room, but Scott Hartnell was not, and it was kind of crazy because Hot Hartnell used to fall down all the time, and I don't think he fell down once in Game Seven against Boston. <laughs> you know, yeah. I was watching that hard yesterday because he had that charity Hartnell down, and he would donate X amount of dollars, and I do forget if that charity was, uh, you know, made available at that particular time, but I'd have to do a little research. Yeah, and I, did I don't. Not do I don't recall so. either. Feels but like an after after that era type of thing. Let's get on to even happier news. Yarif mentioned it, so you could take it away. Tanner Lozinski, what a freaking signing. And finally, finally, he puts to rest what fans' fear was that he would not sign. Heck yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was a huge signing, right? I mean... Jamie, you and I have definitely been talking about it all, all year long, and I think, Dan, you, we can include you in this kind of assumption. I think we were all worried, not for just this year, but for last year as well, that maybe Tanner Lezinski wouldn't end up being a flyer, right? Um, we know what it's like for NCAA players. I mean, we saw our own Kevin Hayes do this to his team, the Chicago Blackhawks. We've seen it happen with Drake Kajula. Uh, we've seen it happen with uh, Blake Wheeler. Obviously, he's a huge name, but we've seen it happen with Jimmy VC, thank you. We've seen it happen uh, with lots of NCAA players where, you know, they're a little bit older, they're a little bit more mature, they want some money, and they want a chance at an NHL spot. And if you don't have the spot for them or if you don't have um, kind of what they're looking for dollar-wise, they might walk. And I think we all thought that that was a possibility here with Lashinsky. So it's really nice that um, Fletcher was able to sign him. I do think... I said this before. I do think the coronavirus might have sped up some of these deals. Again, I, it's, I it's an, right. It's yeah. an economic uncertainty in, in as far as Lashinsky's position. Why wouldn't he want a guaranteed contract, especially in a position where you don't know what's going to happen with the economy? You see jobs failing. You see, um, you know, you see the league kind of in temporary hiatus. Do you really want to risk testing the open market in a time period where maybe the you know, your job might not be there, but at least you're signed up on a contract. You have guaranteed money, right? If you sign up with this NHL team, so. money, uh, right? You get less money, you right? Know, so you risk that, yeah. right? And 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 like I'll 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 open it to you guys in one second, but like the analysis of his talent, I I I mean, I think we'll probably all be around this range where we see him as probably the middle six forward potential, uh, long term. Um, you know what he can produce. I kind of see him as you know. I I brought this up to you, Jamie, for sure. In the long term, we lost Limblom. I don't know if we're going to lose him in the long term. Um, we definitely lost him in the short term. We can assume he's out next year too, right? Especially with this virus combination yeah. of that risk with his, um, you know, with his, uh, you know, with his treatment. You know, they're going to take extra precautions and stuff like that. So let's That's assume he's out. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's let's assume he's out. I mean, maybe Taylor Shinsky is the guy who can win that spot. And not this year, maybe the following year. But a guy that we all are high on, I'm high on, and I think he can be maybe a 40, 50 point player in the NHL uh, playing a two way game. You know, what, what do you guys think? Hey, Dan, you could, Dan, you could go ahead. Uh, I think for sure. I mean, I think he, I mean, with the style that he plays and his size, he's not the, the biggest guy, but he's not a little guy either. He's 6'1, 205 pounds. Uh, he could probably right. step right into the NHL just as a bottom six player, just to plug, just like, um, Torinsky or Bunham and any of those guys, but I think he has more upside than both of those players. Uh, he plays an NHL style game already. When those guys came out of juniors, they weren't they weren't really ready to play. But I think he could step straight out of Ohio, Ohio State and and jump right into the lineup if needed be. But they don't because they're so deep. But it's just a good sign. Yep, I, I, he's in my opinion, he's definitely NHL ready. He's uh, he has proven that he could handle the rigors of an 82-game, you know, either AHL or, in my, in my eyes, in NHL season. I mean, he's stocky, like you, stand, like you mentioned, he stands at 205, but he's got the muscular build, and he's physical. And that was the thing that I liked about him this year is that he became even more physical. And he said that in 2017 to me in an interview that 
you know, I like my physicality, but I think I could be a little more physical. And we saw that he's a good boar battler. The guy has a lethal shot. He could bop and weave in between the, the, you know, opponents. I think, you know, that, and I think both of you know where I stand is that the NCAA is a little more mature game than the CHL. And I'm not knocking the CHL by any means. It's just that some NCAA players are, you know, some of them are 22, 23, even 24, sometimes even 25 years old. So they're already playing against men, in my opinion, as opposed to the CHL level to where you're playing against younger players and you keep filtering it in with younger, 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 17, 18, you know, in 19 year olds. And again, the CHL is a good league. I'm not saying it's not, but I just think that that, that's one of my reasons that Lazinski, his game shows me that he's a little, you know, more, you know, uh, NHL ready than what you said, you know, Connor Bunneman or Carson Sherwinski, you know, coming from Kelowna, you know, and, and I mean, the guy, it's proved he could score. This is his third straight Hobie Baker nominee season here. That is pretty darn impressive. Of course, you know, injuries have riddled him. Last year, he could have been the actual Hobie Baker Award finalist. Uh, you know, if he didn't get hurt, he got hurt, hurt twice last year. He missed almost half the season and still was a Hobie Baker Award nominee. He was a nominee in his sophomore year, and he could have darn been one in his freshman year. But, you know, you, you got to get that status, you know, because uh, he had 10 goals and 22 assists, you know, his freshman season in, in, in 36 games played. He, he, he pod, you know, tallied 32 points. That was pretty darn impressive. I mean, this guy finished his Ohio State career with 48 goals and 143 points. That That is, like, darn impressive. 95 assists. Uh, the guy has elite vision to me, uh, of the ice. And I say the term elite isn't used very often, but I just, this guy just has like eyes in the back of his head. I, it is crazy. For the NCAA level, it was elite. Maybe not so much at the NHL level. He's going to need time. And that's why I no, think I, I could. That's a good point, you know, though, Jamie. I'm sorry to cut you off there, but the, the elite for NCAA, and I'll let you continue, it's a very good point. I mean, every single year he was a point-per-game player in the NCAA. Maybe that do- won't transition to the NHL perfectly, but if you go by his numbers, it's pretty dominant, and that's from the time he's, what, 19, 18 years old? I mean, it's yeah. pretty impressive stuff, especially for a six, sixth-round pick. I mean, it's you're talking oh, about a late, he's, he's a late first-round pick that we got in the sixth round. I mean, people should kind of recognize it. That's what that's where you get these guys. Late first round, late second round, or second it is round. Unbelievable. unbelievable! The scouting that Ron Hextall did, and kudos to Ron Hextall. Sorry, my hat goes off to him right now with Daniel Lazinski. That was an mm-hmm. unbelievable find, an unbelievable hidden. That is an absolute hidden gem in the sixth round, sixth freaking round. Tanner yeah. Lazinski. This and guy. And let's this add to, add to that, Jamie. I'm sorry. Let's add to that, J. J. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, Allison, right? Let's say a similar caliber player, Lashinsky. He was taken in the second round, right? So that's just a little bit, you know, right there shows you we probably took Lashinsky. I don't know, three, four rounds later than he should have been picked. Same thing yeah. with Oscar Limblom. Very... You want another one? Yeah, sure. Definitely. Noah Cates. Noah Cates in there the fifth go. round. Exactly. Yeah. And again, yeah. this is just Ron oh, Hextall he's... and his. One I mean, of the most underrated uh, Flyers prospects in this system is Noah Case. He, he, he might he be as good as the names we I, just mentioned, too. I mean, he's starting to get this appreciation from, you know, high sites and stuff, which is great. And I, there are some sites like Broad Street Hockey has always thought high of Noah Case, so I give him that for sure. Uh, some say he's better. Sure. Oh, yeah. yeah I, I mean, this guy, it, 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 two years ago, he tallies a, you know, tallies a goal between his legs. And that, that was pure skill. That just yeah. showed, that right there was like, uh. I mean, his okay. last year, yeah. last year he he won yeah. the NCAA. He made the All Rookie Team, and he won a silver medal in the uh, World Juniors. So, yeah, the yeah. hell of a year. Reminds you of Mike Richards. In fact, I would actually argue that Lashinsky and Noah Cates are are they're both in that same like Mike Richards, Scott Lawton type of mold. And we need more guys like that. Yeah. I mean, it, it seems like we have enough. We definitely don't, especially guys that can play the middle. Well, here's the thing about Lisinski, and this is my last, you know, this is it for me about Tanner. 
and then I'll let you guys, uh, you know, finish up if you want. Uh, in regards to Tanner, I do believe he's going to do a stint with uh, the, the Lehigh Valley Phantoms just because I go off the Joel Farabee marker. And I know that Farabee, you know, when he came, he was only 19 and that Tanner's 22. I just, uh, it, Joel it was just an amazing talent. And I could, you know, I had it pinned that he would make the team out of camp and he did not. He even did a stint with Lehigh. I do believe Tanner is going to do at least a brief stint with Lehigh, but I firmly believe I could see him being a fourth line center, like about you know November, maybe December, somewhere around there. And I say that because Morgan Frost, I don't foresee him being a fourth line center. He's third and above, in my opinion. So sure. that that's the difference between Tanner Lazinski and Morgan Frost, and that's why I think Tanner has a really good shot. And I don't think he would have signed. With the Flyers. And yes, I do believe. If he didn't. Yeah. Uh, yes. If he didn't have the possibility, at least, you know, at least making the team out of camp or possibly seeing some time if he did do a stint with the Phantoms. I'm pretty sure him and Fletcher had it. But I want to give kudos to Chuck Fletcher here because he could have done what Ron Hextall did a few years ago in terms of trading Tanner Lazinski's rights, uh, you know, for, for, like they did, like Hextall did with Cooper Marotti. He traded him, you know, to uh, the Edmonton Oilers and, and, he, and he got a third round pick for him. So, I, you know, the same thing could have been done for Tanner Lazinski. If Fletcher did not think that Tanner would sign, I think he would have moved him for a, at least a, you know, pretty significant high pick there. And I thought that Tanner was going to sign all along because of what he told me last year in an interview. At, at, around mid March, when he told me that he wouldn't sign, that he wasn't going to sign, he was going back to school for unfinished business, and that's what he told me, quote unquote, unfinished business. When he told me that, and I heard he heard it, the tone in his voice, I was like, I became to, I exhaled, and I was like, okay, I believe he's going to sign because of just what he told me. He could have made up something like, oh well, you know, I just uh, yada yada yada. No. I really firmly believe that he went for unfinished business this year. And, it, you know, it, I don't know. What do you make of that, Dan? I mean, that's great. That. I mean, I, I always – I was never sure that, you know, he was going to sign. I always had that that thought in the back of my mind he could be like Jimmy Vesey. Because, just because of the, the point totals he put up, he could ask for more money. You know what I mean? A team yep. would give it to him, especially yep. a, a team that was not as stacked as the Flyers or not as good, you know, some a team that's – near the bottom of the standings, like, say, the Devils. If the Devils wanted to poach him from the Flyers, I'm sure he could sign for more money there. But I think that the signing really it helps us in, in two ways. Not only do we have another prospect, but um, when the expansion draft comes, it might not be as hard of a hit if he could step right into the lineup to fill somebody's shoes. Yeah, you're not wrong. You're not wrong at all, man. I mean, and that's why that's why great teams, you know, they need organizational depth. It's not about... You know, it's not about stacking up for the playoffs. Actually, that's kind of what was my point earlier when I was making that point about, you know, good thing we didn't trade is because, and I'm not saying that the teams that traded to win a Stanley Cup, that they're dumb for, you know, going out. Because a lot of these teams plan on resigning these guys if they did trade a first for them. Yeah. You know, they're not short-term trades. But, it, but again, it, it shows that you don't win a Stanley Cup by, you know, throwing a team together right before the Stanley Cup finals and hopefully right. get in there. You need organizational depth you need to make sure you can handle injuries you need to be able uh make sure you can handle expansion drafts you know bad trades potentially um you know options where players leave your organization like if Lashinsky left like we just talked about several other players that could come in and take his spot and that is amazing to see and Lashinsky, i think he came in here because you know i obviously said that earlier but maybe he also sees kind of what we see where maybe a stanley cup is within reach and maybe he wants to win a Stanley Cup, and he looks at the group here, and he goes, well, if I'm good enough, which, you know, theoretically, if he is, he's like, I can be part of a Stanley Cup winning team. Uh, even if I am on the third, fourth line, you know, I might have a cup within the first two, three years of my career. And then from there, you know, you know you can make more money long term. If you're a cup winner as a player, your value is pretty much higher everywhere you go after that. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. Now, we got to move on because we got a lot. We got one more thing. At, yep. One more big thing to talk about, because this, this might take a while, too, because I'm going to be honest. Last Friday, I was lo looking at some tweets, you know, on my Twitter line. And, 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 you know, I was bored. I'm not even going to lie. I'm bored, you know, sitting there. 
And this was when, you know, Noah's sleeping and stuff like that, you know, for his nap and stuff. And I'm going through my feed. And what do I see? I saw a Nolan Patrick bust comment. Hmm. And there was this person that had, oh, can you imagine why the Flyers took Nolan Patrick in the second round? Hashtag bust. And I almost fell over. I almost fell over. There was some second overall, of, you mean? Second overall? Oh, yeah, I mean, second overall. Second. Yeah, second overall. Yeah. Oh, what I say? I'm sorry. About so that. You said second yeah. round, but it's okay. Oh, yeah. Thanks a lot. No, <laughs> thanks a lot for correcting me. I did not mean that. But, uh, okay. you know, I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I almost, I almost threw my phone across the room. I was, I, I, I just felt not only is he, not only is he hurt, you know, with a migraine disorder, you know, my prayers or thoughts are always with him, but looking at it, he has reinstalled his Twitter account and now he has to see, ah, a Nolan Patrick bust comment, you know, and he is far from a bust. In my opinion, this guy has 26 goals in two years played. How the heck is he a bust? He he has 61 points, 61, 61 points in two years, and yet in, what, 145 games played, which is a 0.42 uh, points per game average, and yet somehow he's a bust. So I guess Jack Hughes is a bust with seven goals and 14 assists this past year. I guess Dylan Strome was also a bust because in his second year, he had 12 goals and 26 assists this year and finished with 38 points, which was, what, seven more than – you know, uh, what Nolan Patrick finished in his second season. You know, I guess all these guys are bust. Coots is a bust too, right? Uh, you know, took him four or five years to figure out his offensive game and look where he's at now. I guess he's a bust too. Yeah, I, guess I guess Joe Thornton was a bust as well. Joe Thornton. Yeah. 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 Go down the list. Yurif, I know you're freaking butting at it because we talk about this a lot, man. What, what, like, where is this stuff coming from? Um, You know, it's... T- it's there's always I mean there's always group of haters on every on every young player I'm sure even if Elias Pettersson you know started declining for one season you'd see a huge group of maybe even some Flyers fans um, you know that would probably jump on it and be like oh we knew he wasn't that good it was just temporary you know blah 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 but you know ultimately we it, the one thing that's important I mean if you've been watching hockey as long as we have right you've seen a lot of players come in you know we start you start becoming an adult. Uh, you know, as a person, you start realizing that people don't stop developing at the age of 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. And especially a, a player like Nolan Patrick, I mean, you're looking at a guy who in the long term, I mean, you look at those top five players right now, everybody's going clear cut. He's the worst one. Well, are you sure about that long term? That might be the case now, but you're looking at a guy who's much bigger and stronger and just as talented as that group that you're looking at. So as things evolve and as he moves past this injury which i believe he will and i I think you guys are probably pretty confident he will as well i mean you're looking at a guy who had better numbers than leon dreisaitl in the same league i'm not saying he's better than leon dreisaitl i'm not saying he's gonna have a better career but i am saying that you're talking about a similar build you're talking about a similar similar, uh play style and again we talked about sean couturier he's better than couturier offensively at the same age maybe he's not couturier elite defensively but he's got a defensive game as well there's no doubt there's really no downside to drafting a player like this especially in the long term if you miss Yes, it's possible. You could miss on it, but he's not a bust already. I mean, producing what he's done after an injury the way he had it in his rookie year, what kind of 19-year-old player makes the NHL coming back from an abdominal core surgery injury? You know, he they're not you usually don't play in the NHL. They get sent back to juniors. That's what everybody thought was going to happen. And because the Flyers have the world expert here in abdominal core surgeries here in South Philly, you know, that's why he was here for a big portion, but he really wasn't ready. And then last, last year... That that season is a mess. That season is a mess in general. You know, oh, yeah. you look at the impact that Limblom and Konechny had and the growth they had this year with the coaching yep. staff we had, with the way the team was playing. Now, just try to put that on Patrick a little bit. I mean, he didn't have to have a 90-point season this year to be exceptional. He really only needed a 50-point year to show everybody that he's on his way to being an elite player because that's the type of player he is. And most likely, I do see a... Kopitar, whatever like player. I see a Joe Thornton, very Joe Thornton like player, a guy who can play yep. really strong defensive game, but also will play around the boards. Will um, you know? Will make those big passes. Will be able to play around the net. 
be unmovable force, determination. He wasn't an MVP at 16, 17, on the same team that Ivan Provorov is on, by the way, who uh, Provorov is a year older than him at that time as well. You know, he was the MVP of that team, and that wasn't by accident. That wasn't by accident, you know? Yep. That, that's a great point that a lot of people don't know, you know, that a lot of viewers, well, I'll say some viewers may not know. I won't say a lot because, you know, Flyers fans, we are very, you know, we are very dedicated and, you know, they know a lot about their team and know, usually know the ins and outs of, you know, the nooks and crannies of where the majority of these players come from. Dan, what, what, what are your thoughts on, you know, that uh, particular topic? I mean, I, I kind of echo what Yuri was saying. I mean, he's, he is like the future of the team. If you really look at it that way, I mean, him and Couturier and Hayes, I mean, should be the three centers for at least you would think the next five years. Yeah. Um, and he, if he gets the third line matchups that some of the younger players elsewhere get, like when he was his first two years, here, he was saddled as a second line center on mm-hmm. pretty bad teams. They weren't yep. just like a little bad. They were really bad. Right. And Not that well coached either. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's, That's true too, yeah. And yeah. if you just look at the player, don't look at the stats. You don't look at you know what people say about him. If you just watch him play, he's a good player. He's he he was a little snake bitten too his first two years. He's could have had a yep. ton more points than he really should have. But I agree. Um, I think he probably has, if not the best, probably the second best shot on the team. Period. Which I think he needs to let it go a little more. But his shot is is crazy yeah. good. All well, great points. Times I've been at practice. His shot appears to be better than what it has been the previous two years. I'll tell you that. Uh, That's crazy. And this is just practice. Mind you, it's just practice. It's not game time, so there might be a little less pressure on him. To, and there might not be as much pressure because he knows he can't play. So there's a lot of different factors that may factor into this you know, shot performance. But I'll tell you, it's uh, very encouraging to see him uh, you know, put like just what you just said. I mean, I mean quite, quite I mean, it's accurate. It's not hitting the post. It's hitting the net. And one one other thing that I wanted to say, Dan, you just came up with a great topic there. You know why? Because matchups. And that's what this Flyers team is about. AV rolls four cons- consistent good lines before the suspension hit. You know, he was rolling four consistent good lines. So top defensemen didn't know what line to match up against. And that's why I would have liked to have seen, you know, what what – we will see, even if it's this year, or even if it's next year. I think he's going to be back if the season reconvenes, but because I've always operated under that. But like, just looking at it, I'd love to see how he would excel. Okay, I might be playing the bottom pairing, de- you know, defenseman because you know the second line's popping at this time, so they might get the top line, and then the top line might get the second. You know what I mean? That's what I mean. Like this creates a matchup problem. You know, for a matchup nightmare for teams to play us is because they don't know where to put their defensemen on, you know, on what line to face up a matchup wise. And Patrick messes all that up because teams around the league know how talented he is. I've heard it. I've heard it in the press box. Like Patrick, Patrick, Patrick. Like there, there's a lot of Patrick love within the NHL surrounding the confines. And, uh, you know, Fletcher loves this young man. I mean, how many times has he said, he said at the deadline, you cannot replace a Nolan Patrick. You know, a Nolan Patrick could only take you further, you know, but it is hard to find a Nolan Patrick without cost. Remember that, you Yeah, no, I mean, no doubt. I mean, listen, he's a second overall pick, a guy who's touted to go first overall for three years in a row up until his abdominal core injury. The Flyers still could be one of the luckiest teams from that draft. I know in retrospect, I'm sure a lot of people want another player, but think the long game. The Flyers aren't that good yet anyway. I mean, we were talking about the team earlier, and I love our team right now. I do. And I think Dan's perception of the defense, sneaky good is the right uh, the right term there. Because that what I want to say is that we're really just getting started. And I know that everybody thinks that we're not, and everybody probably thinks that we're, you know our kind of small window is opening up, but it's not a small window. It's a large window that's going to be open for a while if it's managed properly. If you're looking at that team that went to the finals, that defense, you know, it was backed by highly talented players, and I would argue we probably have maybe equal amount of talent on the back end now, but there's a huge youth 
to veteran discrepancy that we didn't necessarily have back then. Now, I, I do think our defense today is deeper, which obviously is phenomenal. But let's see what happens when Provorov gets a couple years older. I mean, you're talking about players who will continue to get better. And Pronger was incredible. He also wasn't incredible until he was about 24 years old, 25 years old. Yeah. He wasn't even that good, actually, as a young defenseman. And, and that's what people need to realize is we're really just getting started. Like, Nolan Patrick at 20 isn't anything. I want to see Nolan Patrick at 25 when he's bigger and stronger than everybody else, like sh- what Sean Couturier is doing today. I mean, you're talking about a window that could open of a team that is just fully deep. Maybe Lashinsky's part of it. We already know we have the three pillars, right? And we know for sure we have the three pillars. The three pillars are your goaltender in Hart. We have our number one in Provorov, and we have our number one in potentially either pro- either uh, you know we obviously we have Couturier who will be here for a while, but we have Patrick, we have Frost. Right, we have we have two young players already that could be number one centers in the system. That does include any of the other sneaky young good players that we have that can make their way into that group. So, you know, we have the pieces here to compete, and that doesn't include any move we might make in the future. So what we need to do is realize that Patrick is a huge part of this building block that we have moving forward. He's a seventeen year investment, not a three year investment, right? They knew oh. that going into this, right? So I imagine what they see is brewing hopefully which is one of the best players to ever wear a flyers uniform because that's where i see a ceiling um yeah just just to touch on old patrick again sorry jamie um yeah, sorry. was uh if you if you look at the at katuri's stats and it, it's very similar to to patrick's stats very. um early on in his career and even katuri was afforded to play on the third line he was always sheltered away from always um, not not shelter, but I would say like they didn't lean on him to score. Whereas Patrick, when he came in, yeah. they wanted him like you got to score X amount. Well, the fans thought X amount of goals. You know, yeah. and he was put on that second line right away. Um, Kateri was taking a lot of defensive zone faceoffs. He was relied more on just to play defense. Uh, on a better team, on a, better on a be- team. yeah, a way deeper, better team with yeah. a lot of you know really good proven vets. But you know, pa- uh, Patrick was playing with with Weiss. He was playing with like some of these guys that aren't even in the NHL anymore. Right. So, um, <laughs> And that was only a year ago. It's not. It's not like it was three years ago. It was last right. year. And, uh, right. He just. He, if you watch him play, you can just tell. Like he is you a difference maker. It. He's not. It's not that he's out there and you don't even notice him. He's making you know good plays in his own end, and you know when he's on it in on the forecheck and he's getting in there and he has people to give the puck to. He's making stuff happen. He's not. He's not just some guy that you're just going to write off as like oh yeah. you know he's a boss. Let's get rid of him. That's crazy. Well, well said, man. And yeah. and to that point, sorry, Jamie. And to that point, what if you guys do remember when Patrick was put on the power play with Claude Giroux and everybody? He outperformed Wayne Simmons like immediately in that power play position. I think we all saw it. I think he had four goals in four opportunities wow. in a row. You know, when you put him with talent, he's probably going to score more goals than we're used yeah. to. I and mean, like you said that shot. He's got a great shot. Couturier's second season, he finished with four goals and eleven assists, and Pat. Patrick's second season with a crazy influx season. Hexall getting fired. Hexall getting fired. You know, this one getting traded. You know, Simmons gets traded. Uh, you know, other pieces are gone. We the whole the whole darn team like, you know, went kit and caboodle, and he still ended up with 13 goals and 18 assists for 31 points, which was 16 a- more points higher than Sean Couturier's second season, and he played the same. Now, Coots was very good defensively, and I'll tell you in that series, you know, against Pitt, that's when he, you know, let's be honest there. But, uh, you know, but, uh, defensively. I, I mean, but Patrick, Patrick plays well defensively too. He is a two way player, and he stands at, he, he's, he, he weighs 198 pounds. And I think that's something, you know, he's got the build, and he's going to get stronger. But one narrative, this is my final thing on, uh, this Nolan Patrick, because, uh, I th- think we could sit here all night and just debate, you know, like, I, I, again, I couldn't believe this particular person that said he was a bust happened to, uh, I believe, like a Canadian team of some sort. Uh, I don't want to rip, you know, on any, you know, person or whatever, but I just have a different narrative than what this person believed. And everyone's entitled to their opinion. And I'm not saying that they're stupid by any means or cutting them up by any means. But uh, uh, to me, the, it, it just doesn't show that he's a bust. But I don't agree with the narrative of going back into the draft. And that's also what I saw, you know, last week, too, is that some people wanted to, you know, bring up 
you know, let, you know, the 2017 draft and who would you go, who would we pick now knowing what we know now? I'm going to be firm. I'm going to stand with Nolan Patrick. I'm sorry. I, I will not go for Peterson. I won't go, you know, for Kale McCarr. I won't go for Histon. I, it's all very tempting, but I stand firm with Nolan Patrick because I believe highly in this young man. And that's just my personal opinion. Does anybody want to chime in on that? I never agree with that narrative anyway of going back into drafts, and I'm not about to do it in, I, in uh, regards to Nolan Patrick's I hate, situation. I hate re- I hate redrafts. Yeah. It's dumb. Yeah, there's no, there's no point. I mean, you know how many teams wish that they took Shane Goss to in the third round, you know, and that's just one name. I mean, Nicholas Lidstrom, I think, you know, went all the way to seven, if I remember. I, I think Datsuk was also seven. I mean, Luke Robitaille undrafted. I mean, we can go down the list. I mean, it's on uh, Claude Giroux. How many teams passed up on Claude Giroux? Look at that redraft. You know, you're telling me he's not a top two, top three pick from that draft. Like, what are you yeah. nuts? Even though, even though that was a great draft. It's just like it's stupid. It's it's stupid. It's really that it should be thought of. Did you get high value for what you got? Not is he better than the other player? And because these numbers are not equal. I mean, two years ago, everybody was saying Nick, uh, Kucherov is the best player in the National Hockey League, and I don't hear that anymore. Now I hear Drysidle, and it's like don't get me wrong; these are all incredible athletes, and I oh, yeah. see them in in that conversation. But numbers fluctuate. Team performance fluctuates. You just got to look for players. And like I think Dan brought up the best point there is you have to watch them on the ice. You have to see what they're doing. I, I believe Mike Johnson um, last year, maybe it was this year, picked uh, you know Patrick to be the breakout player. And he said that exactly. He said if you watch his highlights, you're like, how does this guy not have more points? And I, I would agree with that. The, the amount of po- post, the lack of talent he played with, the amount of just – in fact, he was snake bit or – just seems like a series of bad luck for Patrick, and that will not continue. Again, this was a kid who was extremely successful. You know, this this isn't a kid who you know had one great year and then we got excited about him. This was a kid who had a great pedigree in general and still does. And his uncle is like a legend in James Patrick. So it's like that's yeah. the type of kid we're dealing with. So we should bet on him, bet on him to rebound. Yeah, and I think I, I think a lot of Flyer fans are. I think a lot of this bus talk and whatever. Is so outside. Too. It is outside talk. I don't. I really don't foresee. It just burnt me. It just struck a nerve with me because I'm tired of it. And you know, I never wish ill on any athlete. Even when Crosby gets hurt, you know, I pray for him. You know, Malkin gets hurt. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Like these these guys, they put so much on the line. Like there's so maybe much not during the playoffs beat. though, right? Maybe not. Maybe no, not during the playoffs. Just no, just in general, but not during the playoffs, right? Nobody I'm gonna be honest. I want them at full health. I want them at full health during the playoffs. Oh, I know you are. I know you are. But I want them at full health during the playoffs. Why? Because I think we're a better team than them, and I want them at full health. Because then that narrative will come out there. Oh well, they were missing Crosby, and I don't want that out there because I think that we could sweep Pittsburgh. To be honest, I, I I firmly stand behind it right now. That's how things. Sweet. That's how high you think, I think. You think we can sweep, sweep the pants? Absolutely. Damn, no somebody pens. just got so no. cocky, Jamie. Dude, I don't. I, it's not even about being cocky. It's about being legit. When I, I just think that we match up better sweep. than you know against the Penguins. I, I agree. I listen, I don't know if I, I don't know if I agree with the sweep, but I definitely agree we can beat the Penguins in the like, playoffs. I, I am so high on Carter Hart and Elliot as a tandem right now. That, you know, even if they just played, even if A.V. just trusted Carter Hart at home, let's say, let's just say hypothetically, you know. And then he was like, okay, well, I'm going to start Elliott, you know, maybe one game, you know, against Pittsburgh, you know, in game, you know, game three and then finish up with Carter Hart in game four. Who knows what's going to happen? You know, I think that they need to have a long leash. And I think A.V. will, you know, Carter Hart's the man going in. But I'm just saying, you know, he might do that for a matchup purposes. I don't know what A.V. is going to do. Only AV knows what he's going to do, and I'll trust anything he puts out there because I believe highly in both. I'm sorry, Brian Elliott showed me something. He beat he beat a juggernaut in the Washington Capitals five to two after nine games off of not seeing rubber, and he did it, and he didn't let up a softy at all. So that impressed me. That game was like, oh my god, damn, he just beat the hell out of the Caps. And I know, the, and I know the Flyers played very well that game. And I'm not cutting them short by any means. But t- nine games off coming in against Alice Ovechkin isn't just the easiest thing to do, you know. So uh, I don't know. I I, I think I, I think we're a better team than Pens. I I think we kill them. I, I do. You know, 
you, you remember, I, I love you remember, the I love the optimism. I love the optimism, Jamie. So, Four game sweep yeah. is tough though against. I don't know. I, it's tough for me to count out Sidney Crosby and Malkin and say that they wouldn't win a game. I don't know. Too much talent. But I, I love the sentiment. I mean, I do think we're. I think we're a deeper team than the Penguins. I think the Penguins have sacrificed their depth throughout the years, and it is it is catching up with them. They still have their elite guys, so they're always going to be a good team. They're a disciplined team. They're well-coached, so they're always going to be competitive. But I do think this is becoming the Flyers' time, and I think we're going to pass the Capitals as well. And I think people were kind of seeing the beginning of this. I mean, th- this is kind of what I was hoping to see. I don't want to say I predicted it. But again, with the names, this is kind of what I was referring to, with the organizational depth with the drafting that Hextall has done that we're talking about. And this is just the beginning. I truly believe this is just the beginning. And just wait until we're able to package a deal for another superstar player because that will happen at some point. I mean, look at the amount of assets we have. You know, eventually we'll be the Tampa Bay Lightning, hopefully better. Hopefully we result in a championship and organizational depth. Yeah, I think I, I think they make a big move at the draft. Uh, and move up. We talked about that within five to ten. And Dan, if you want to chip in, you could chip in there. Uh, if you think that the Flyers, you know, will move up or not, or stand firm, or make a, you know, what you think would make a package deal, uh, maybe to obtain, you know, a sniper to, Lord uh, bless his soul, maybe uh, at the moment, Oscar Lindblom. Uh, I mean, right now, I, I, this is just the beginning of what they what their potential is you know what i mean because um it's there's there's just so many positives about the team there's not there's not many negatives what can you point to that you say well i don't know about this or i don't know about this like the defense is young like you said we have three studs on the back end that are only going to get better in Provorov, sandheim and myers you have a known commodity in a certain way with gossip bear who's not even playing because they're that deep at defense um, we even talk about york we talk about Cam yeah, York, I right? Mean, the pipeline is just stacked. I mean, that's what stacked. I'm saying. It's, there's Jamula, no, York, there's not one Kalinuk. thing you can point to where you're saying like, oh, you got to look out down the line because they're not going to have this because they have depth at every single position. I mean, that's counting even, Patrick even goaltending. Playing, playing, but yeah, yeah goaltending as well. But it's where where do you see any deficiency in the future or even in the present with the Flyers roster? Yeah, yeah, it's very hard. We, we have to, like, uh, hurry this up because there's a certain amount of time left, uh, only a few minutes. Yeah, we got, uh, we, got two to, we got three minutes left here, buddy. Right. I just, I just want to touch on uh, David Bernhardt has to has to have a contract by June 1st or else he becomes a free agent. Linus Hogberg also needs a contract by June 1st or else he also becomes a free agent. And Wade Howison also has until August 15th uh, to sign or uh, he becomes a free agent. I firmly believe that Wade Allison will sign in the coming days. We shall see. Yes or no to Wade Allison Me signing, too. starting yes. with Dan. 100% yes. yes. Yeah, Allison, yes, for sure. I think he's a, a very important player in the future of this team. I, I think the other two, we we mightn't, but I think Allison, for sure. You know, I don't yeah. see why not. I don't see why not. And you know how I feel about defensive prospects. I think with defensive prospects, at the very least, if they don't want to ELC him, they should ATO him. Uh, it's kind of tough for a European player to be ATO'd. Uh, they're taking a very, you know, risk, but the, it could have some reward. You look at David Drake, who's been in the Flyers organization the past two years, played with the Reading Royals and being called up to the Phantoms at times, and his ATO has paid off. He came from the University of Connecticut. So the same thing, I think David Bernhardt is at the very least a very good AHL player. But with that, we're going to have to wrap this up. We have like uh, about two minutes left, I believe. Uh, love you all. Thank you very much for having us on. Dan, yeah. uh, give your information. Thanks for having me, guys. It was fun. Yeah. Where, where, can, where can people find you again? At dmilla18 on Twitter. Yep. Follow me, Yareev, at ywallach at, on Twitter as well. Definitely follow all of our writers, too. I mean, for sure, Dan is part of the team. We're going to bring on more people, obviously, and we're going to keep this going through the summer. There are going to be more videos, everything. We don't care, you know, no season, no problem, you know, for us. We're going to we're going to keep talking, you know, as long as you guys are keep listening and keep reading. Um, we'll keep coming out with content. Thank and like you. Reef, like you Reef said, we're going to have David Bernard on here in the coming months. We're going to have possibly Linus Hogberg on here. 
in the coming months. We're going to have a lot of prospects come on, including draft D prospects as well. That is our plan. And we're going to stick to it. Here at FlyersNittyGritty.com, just because some people are in the offseason, we are not. And we will operate under the impression that the season will reconvene at some point. Thank you all for listening. We love you all. You can find me at, at Jamie Basco, FlyersNittyGritty.com, and I'll take a part of uh, your, what your brief said. Follow all our writers. They're all very talented. They're all very special in their own way. Take care. We love you all. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.